mountains of ham, rivers of olive oil, and lakes of wine. Today, we're gonna to explore one of the largest supermarkets in Madrid, so I can show you what we eat, what we drink in this country, the wonderful, unique Spanish snacks there are, and so you can also see how is it different from your supermarket back home, a typical Spanish supermarket. So, venga, let's go. Hey guys, I'm James Black and welcome to Spain Reveal. This channel is all about helping you explore and understand Spain like a local. And there's nothing more local than checking out a supermarket in a country. They're kind of like museums of current culture, if that makes any sense. They reveal how we live our lives, what's important to us. So we're gonna dive into this enormous supermarket. But one of the concerns I have is that we don't have permission to film. I'm worried they might kick us out. So we're gonna go gorilla. Yoli's filming on the iPhone. So we're gonna pretend to shop normally and try and show you what's going on inside and we're gonna keep it a little bit low-key and quiet so shh, let's go in so it's like I'm walking through a ham jungle we eat so much ham in this country and there is a section in the supermarket purely for ham I'm surrounded by it they're sweating they look delicious all the different grades jamón serrano jamón ibérico of course if you're here for a brief amount of time stick to the ibérico it's just so good a little more expensive and they also cut it by hand here for you so you have to choose your grade for the person who has everything you need to get them a collapsible ham stand so you can collapse it have it at Christmas have your ham going at Christmas, then stick it in the spare room, collapsed for the rest of the year. A lot of people just have a ham at home just at Christmas. We've also got over here hams that come in boxes. Oh, so many ways you can buy ham. Find the cheapest ham and the most expensive ham so you can see the difference. This one down here in front of me is from the Alpujarras from Granada and it's 30 euros, 30 euros. for the whole ham. So cheap. So white hoof pig, serrano ham, probably not cured that long. 30 euros for that whole thing. That is, I don't think I've ever seen it that cheap. Let's find the most expensive. Okay, the most expensive is Cinco Jotas, 5J, you'll see it. Uh, and it's a ham here that is just the ham. You also get some other cured meat with it and a knife, but you're gonna pay 569 euros. So that's a lot of, that's like a million percent more. I'm sure it's not, but you get the idea. 30 euros or 500 odd euros, the difference. So. Ham for everyone, for all budgets. Of course, it's not just ham or jamon that we get from the pig. You've got so many other forms of cured pork here. There's one, two, three, about three or four aisles of cured pork products packed up. We eat a lot of pork in this country. I'm not sure what the statistics are, but it's insane. For the person who loves cured meats at Christmas, serious envelope of this stuff. My God. So to give you an idea of cured meat prices here, they can go pretty cheap. Five euros, and you've got 300 grams of a whole selection here of ham, probably pretty average ham, chorizo, salchichon, the whole deal. But yeah, I'd stick away from this stuff. It might be a bit rough. These are not tapas, just in case you're confused when you arrive. Small little crackers with nothing on them are not tapas. My favorite cured meats in this country is a Catalan cured sausage called fuet, F-U-E-T. It means whip in Catalan, because it's shaped like a whip and it's narrow. But it is so yummy, perfect with wine, little slices, my God, once you start, you cannot stop and you'll eat the whole, the whole fuet. I've been there, it's addictive. Here's a paradox that I don't understand in this country. And if you live in Spain, please let me know. You can give me the insight. Pechuga de pavo, turkey breast. You see it everywhere in this country in these slices, but nobody eats turkey apart from this. So you can't like buy turkey. So you're eating all this turkey breast and there's no turkeys. What are we doing with the rest of it? Is this turkey breast? Is this turkey? Please let me know in the comments below because I'm kind of fascinated. I think there might be a conspiracy. Hang on, I solved it. There's another bit of turkey here. Taquitos de pavo. Little cubes of highly natural turkey. So there it is. That's where the rest of it goes, I guess, into taquitos. We're gonna deal on pig's brains, 150 for two, and a deal on pig's snout, 160 for two. So the snout's a little more expensive than the brains. So funny that. So you can see all the fishmongers behind me and I've always been so impressed by the fish sections and supermarkets here in Spain. There's so much variety, particularly a huge amount of variety also of prawns, langostinos, all these different varieties have different names in Spanish, but in English we seem to not have as many names. Maybe there's scientific names, but really, really impressive. And these guys, they'll cut the fish up for you, they'll scale it, they'll gut it, everything. They'll ask you how you're gonna cook it. So this is a pretty impressive selection. Most of Spain's fish, seafood, comes through the north from the lonjas or the fish markets in the north of the country, particularly in Galicia. So if you ever see these in a supermarket, gulas, what they are is actually fake baby eel, named after angulas, which are real baby eels, and are about a thousand euros a kilo because they've been overfished. And so I think it was in the 80s, company made up these fake ones, which are made from like surimi, like crab meat with a K, and they are painted like baby eels. Everyone knows they're fake. Uh, well, even not though, everyone, though. Well, not everyone? Okay, not everyone knows they're fake. And it says <laughs> la authentica, the authentic 
fake baby eel. <laughs> and particularly popular in the Basque country in the north, you do a stir fry with chili or garlic. Strange little cultural thing. So here we have a mixture of two types of anchovies called a matrimonio or a marriage. It's vinegar marinated anchovies and salt cured anchovies and you actually often eat them together and that's why it's called a matrimonio or a marriage. They're perfect when combined and they are sold shrink wrapped and combined. So I bet you don't have that back home. Shrink wrapped razor clams. Shrink wrapped razor clams. That one's easier to say. Sea snails anyone at $14.99 a kilo. So I don't know how many little bunches you need to make a kilo of sea snails, but you can find out when you come visit. So I come from New Zealand where fresh milk is a religion. And here, when I moved to Spain, it's all about UHT milk. It means it lasts and doesn't have to be refrigerated. Same in France as well. And so this fresh milk section here is tiny and the UHT, the pre-treated, pre-treated -heat, pre heat, bleh, however it's said, is like two or three aisles of that stuff. So what's the difference? More or less fat? I don't know. When you come and it's summer, drink horchata. Ideally get the good horchata, this is a little bit industrial, but it's not the horchata that you might think of from Mexico, which I think is made with rice milk, but this is from chupas or tiger nuts and it's the most refreshing drink in summer. Horchata, there's a lot of horchata here, different flavors, different types. Does your supermarket at home have prepackaged pig's ear? I highly doubt it. You can buy your rabbit whole or in bits. So seven euros for a whole rabbit. Never been a big rabbit fan, but yeah, not bad. Of course, the classic blood sausage. Really do try it when you come here. It's delicious, especially the stuff with rice in it. 270 for one, two, eight slices of blood sausage. On the grill, really, really good. A little bit crunchy and it's a new superfood. Blood sausage is the new kale, full of whatever it's full of. It's good for you. So give it to your kids. When you're buying coffee in a supermarket, you'll see mezcla, mix, or natural, natural. Mezcla mix means that it's part natural coffee beans, been roasted naturally, and part torrefacto, which is a process where a little bit of sugar is burnt onto the coffee beans. It has a kind of a crazy history. I'll put a link to an article down below about it. But you want, in my opinion, natural. The mezcla tastes really burnt and hard. And I love that it's called bonka. The whole mezcla natural thing just drove me bonkers when I first moved here because I was like, why does the coffee taste so terrible? And I was buying mezcla, even some of the natural stuff. So I don't know. Do you like it? Let me know below if you're super into Spanish torrefacto coffee. There might be three of you. The word donut actually does exist in Spanish, but it refers to the specific brand donuts. If you say, I'm going to have a donut, that's what you're going to have, this brand. And it's a donut. But if you're saying plural, you have people say donus. They don't say the T. It's like, quiero unos donos. T gets skipped out. Why does T get skipped out? Too hard? Too hard. Too hard. T's too hard. When I moved originally to France uh, before I lived in Spain, and they had these at breakfast, these like little toast things that are like little hard breads. I find it really weird because it's like, you either have toast or you have bread, but there's a sort of pre-toasted, crunchy thing. So something a lot of people eat for breakfast are magdalenas, which are like really simple cupcakes. And I actually got really into them when I first moved here and put on a lot of weight, so <laughs> full of crap. But <laughs> So be careful. Another obsession of mine when I first moved here was pan de leche or milk bread. These little soft, pillowy, cloud-like sweet bread things. I was obsessed. It contributed to my weight gain and I loved it. The Bimbo brand. Bimbo. Um, a word that's a little different in English. So a candy that's quite big here, but potentially racist are conguitos, little chocolate candies, which obviously conguito means what? Little people from the Congo? Yeah, little people from the Congo. So maybe that's from the dictatorship, not sure, but a little out of time, I think on that one. Might need to tweak that. So for all my Kiwi friends out there, the Milo of Spain is Colacao, this chocolate drink, warm chocolate drink that Kids drink it, adults drink it, everybody drinks cola cow. A lot of people still drink cola cow even into their mature years. I heard someone order one in a bar the other day with extra frothy milk. See in the international section here, Marmite. I got Yoli into Marmite after a few years and now she loves it. So we're taking one home. So we're taking some Marmite home because we're almost out. This is the English Marmite, not the Kiwi Marmite. We're almost out of Kiwi Marmite. So if you haven't ever tried Marmite, you will hate it for the first five years when you try it. But then one day, all you will want that morning for breakfast is Marmite. Trust me, you gotta work through those five years though. We're in the aperitif section. Nuts, potato chips, and olives. Potato chip flavors are a precise reflection of what people eat when they're not eating potato chips. And so, one of my favorite guilty pleasures is jamon flavored potato chips. These, man, once you start, you will never stop. <laughs> When I grew up, it was chicken flavored chips in New Zealand and here Sabora Jamon, it's such a guilty flavor. Rufles, how we say ruffles here, ham flavored, out of control. Try them if you come. Do you have ham flavored Pringles back home? Here we do, 
and flavored Pringles. Never really been a big fan of Pringles. They always taste like you know, like dehydrated potato or something. Always taste a bit funny, but ham flavored, even in the Pringles. A very Spanish combination of flavors is garlic and parsley. One of my favorite dishes, gambas al ajillo, prawns with garlic and parsley, is delicious. And here we have potato chips that are garlic and parsley. So it's true, potato chip flavors really just show you what people are eating when they're not eating potato chips. I know that's a bit confusing, but I think, I think there's something in that. Ham, garlic, and parsley. This is a country where we eat a lot of fried eggs and we have fried egg flavored potato chips. I've never seen these before. Fried egg potato chips, we're buying these. I'm taking these back, I wanna try these. So we've found Yoli's favorite snack when she was growing up. Pelotatos, so delicious. So it's actually the kind of the greasiest snack in the market. So you can just get one of these, it's pelotas bowls, like football bowls. So you just get one of those on the floor and then just step on it. And then when you withdraw the paste, there's like this stain of like grease and on the floor. Wow, let's get a pack, they sound great. Yummy. <laughs> Sometimes when you're in a tapas bar, you'll get given pork rinds, cortezas, as a tapa. And man, they are dangerous. You have about three of those and you're gonna have a stomach ache, I always find. And I love these ones. They have like this little ham with like corteza, with pork rind coming out of it. Curious, sort of odd, a little bit scary. And then for those rich people out there, you have Iberian potato chips. Not just normal ham potato chips, Iberian ham potato chips. Huge canned olive section behind me, but little tip is that if the supermarket you're going to has a fresh olive section, that's where you want to go. And we're gonna to go to there after this. I wouldn't buy the canned stuff. They're fine, but fresh is kind of tastier. A classic Spanish snack, the most classic Spanish snack, and a real challenge for me are pipas, sunflower seeds. And you buy them, they're covered in salt. I know you eat these in the States, for example, at baseball games, and you open them with your teeth and suck out the pip with your the seed with your tongue. For idiots like me who still can't figure it out, you have peeled ones. Is that what they call? Pelada. So Pelada. I you say peeled. Uh, and so you just can eat them directly. But as I say, I would need those. They're like training wheel pipas. Because I can't get it. I can't figure it out. I feel like I'm always going to split my teeth in two or something. And you see people who have been eating them. There's just a pile of shells all around them. Okay, my personal challenge to you is can you handle white asparagus? These guys, they're super scary. And I hope my mother-in-law's not watching because she serves them Christmas. And it's like, I have to, or every weekend, look at this guy. Wow, I have to like, I choke my way through them. I mean, I eat pretty much everything, but, and I eat them, but white asparagus, still not there yet. Still not there. With mayonnaise. With mayonnaise, always so gluggy, so gross. This is an entire section dedicated to white asparagus. The bane of my gastronomic existence in Spain. They're not cheap either. If you love these, and a lot of people do, they're a delicacy. This one here, you get 10 to 14 white asparagus in this can, 11 euros, 11 euros. Remember, you can buy an entire ham for 30 euros. So, man, yeah, you can spend a lot of money on white asparagus if you're really into it. White gold. Do you like white asparagus? Uh my mom watching. <laughs> <laughs> Yoli's Spanish and even she's not convinced on the white asparagus thing. Yeah. We need to figure this out. Do you love white asparagus? Love it or hate it? Let me know below. It's always interesting in a supermarket when you have traditional dishes but done in a pre-packaged form. Things that you would never have in another country. So here we have Madrid stew, cocido madrileño, which is the classic meat, vegetable and chickpea stew that you have in winter and is really delicious in a can. Cocido madrileño in a can. We also have up here, callos a la madrileña in a can. So that is tripe stew, Madrid tripe stew. So, I mean, you wouldn't necessarily even get these maybe in other parts of Spain. I don't know, maybe in a little bit, but these are regional pre-packaged produce. One of the delicacies in this country is canned seafood. Now, the idea might freak you out a little bit. I mean, we have wonderful fresh seafood, but you also have amazing canned seafood and a huge tradition of it. Often, shellfish, for instance, can actually be more expensive in the can than it was fresh, because the idea is if it's canned well, it's a wonderful way to preserve seafood, and it actually improves the flavor. I've read about famous Michelin star Spanish chefs, who one of their favorite food memories is to get a great can of canned, can of canned cockles, open them up, a little bit lemon on it, and just sit there and eat them, and I totally understand, so you have to try it when you come to visit. So we have canned calamari in American sauce, salsa americana, which is like a tomato sauce, I believe. Canned squid in its black ink from Galicia, from the north. Squid, again, in its own ink. Do you think the Velasquez family gets commission on these canned calamari in American sauce? 
canned razor clams, canned scallops, canned fake baby shrimp, uh, <laughs> fake baby eels, sorry, canned clams, canned cod liver, very specific, canned mayulas, I don't even know what mayulas are, I've never seen them before, love the packaging, oh, look at that king, canned cockles, and poton, poton is like weird bottom crawling um, uh, octopusy sort of uh, calamari type thing. Very vague, I know, sorry about that. Well, look it up. And stuffed squid in its own ink, I think. So you can see there's an enormous section here dedicated to canned mussels. These are all canned mussels. So many brands, I can never get over how many brands there are. One little thing that I actually really love about the canned seafood in this country is the packaging. There are so many brands of canned seafood and a large proportion of the packaging looks like it hasn't been updated since like the 19, 50s or 60s. I love that font. It's such an old school font. And of course, we're in the land of olive oil. Spain makes almost half the world's olive oil and the average Spaniard eats or drinks, eats two and a half gallons, which is 10 liters of olive oil a year. And you can see the huge array here from little boutique brands to more industrial brands, everything from normal to virgin to extra virgin. Let's check out some of the prices out because even extra virgin is really cheap here. And that's why if you're in Spain, you gotta eat the extra virgin. We've got extra virgin, it's the supermarket's brand and and it's three euros 59 for a liter. Let me know actually, I'm really interested in the comments. How does that compare to the price of olive oil in your country? So the cheapest I can see, 3.59 for a liter. And an important thing to remember is when it doesn't say virgin or, or extra virgin, if it just says uh, 0 0.4 or 0, 0.4, that is just normal olive oil. And actually that is what I'm gonna call technically in a sense lampante oil because historically it was used for lamp oil. So of course those were a little bit more industrial olive oils and you can spend more, you know, we do have Boutique or really high grade olive oil in this country. This one, for example, is 500 mils and that's 8 euros 60, so a lot more expensive. That's organic. One thing to keep in mind extra virgin olive oil in Spain is actually a technical term. It means it's passed a smell test, a taste test, and a chemical test, so you can be guaranteed that it's high quality if it says extra virgin. We had Velasquez on the canned uh, calamari in its own ink, and now we have Goya on the olive oil. That's not Goya, obviously. No, that's the <laughs> Duchess of Alba, but Goya painted it. <laughs> Here's something you wouldn't see in an English-speaking country is washing powder or washing liquid called colon. If you like sparkling water, Vichy Catalan is actually quite a yummy one. It's a little bit salty, but it always makes me think of Vichy, of occupied France and the Vichy collaborators. The beer from Madrid is called Mao. And if you're hardcore and you're having a party, this is what you want to buy. They're called Litronas. And that is a liter, as the name suggests, of beer. And so litrona means that. And that's how you buy it when people are coming over. Big thing. Well, that's how we buy it anyway. And so behind me, all this beer along here is alcohol-free. And Spain is one of the leaders in alcohol-free beer. And it's really interesting because this is a beer-drinking country more than it is, in a way, a wine-drinking country. So many people drink beer. And so if you can't drink beer for whatever reason, for health reasons, or you're pregnant, or whatever it is, there's a huge industry of zero alcohol beer. And you'll see it'll be zero comma zero. And that's how you know it. Every brand has one. All the bars have zero alcohol beer. I've even seen TV commercials for zero alcohol beer, and there's an image of a pregnant woman, like with her belly, with a baby in it, drinking a zero alcohol beer. So it's super accepted, and you'll see it everywhere. I find it tastes weird. Something happens when you take the alcohol out that something goes wrong. Call me crazy. One thing, when I first moved to Spain eight years ago, craft beer was just not a thing. And now it's really pretty big. Again, because this is a big beer drinking country. And you'll find, this is one of the earlier ones here. It came in Madrid, La Virgen. And they have a jamonera beer. Jamonera. I think they said once it goes well with a ham sandwich. Bocadillo de jamón. And so now you'll see a huge range of, of local beers, Madrid beers. The movement started really in Catalonia. And of course, the big industrial brands are now making their own artisan beer so yeah huge huge beer industry madrid beer brand is the is named after the the goddess in the fountain statue in the center of the city and here we have the brown haired girl and the, the blonde haired girl morena y rubia ole mi morena so you'll see a huge gin selection always in Spain because we're massive gin drinkers here. You'll see in bars people drink big balloon-sized glasses of gin. They drink it after the meal, not before, not as a cocktail because we'll have something like vermouth or sherry or something else beforehand. So huge gin selection behind me and the gin and tonics here. I mean, it's a craze. It's dying down a little bit, but they're large. And often the bartender just keeps pouring and he'll stop when you tell him to stop. For the vermouth lovers out there, we have pretty decent selection. Pretty serious. And if you're a really serious vermouth drinker, you can get a box of it. Uh, you can't even lift it, let alone drink it. But that's if you're a serious aperitivo freak. And look at this guy, 1.5 liters of vermouth. That's white vermouth, 1.5 liters. By the way, little tip. 
you're in Spain, don't drink martini. It's, I call it the Coca-Cola of vermouths. You want to get the, the local stuff, not the international brand. So this is still wine country. We do drink a lot of beer, but we make a lot of wine, even though we don't drink as much as we used to. So time for a little game. I'm going to try and find the cheapest wine here in the supermarket and the most expensive. See how we go, because wine can be pretty cheap in this country. To be clear on the rules, I'm going to rule out box Tetra Brick wine. <laughs> this one is a liter for 90 cents. I feel like we need to stick to the, stick to the glass. Okay, so we have found the cheapest wine here. It's called Elegido, which means the chosen one. And it's a Tempranillo. It's 196 for a liter. It says superior, calidad superior, high quality. Who am I to judge? And it says here on the back, it's from Spain. It's Tempranillo and it goes well with tapas, as if that's a food group, red meats and cheeses. So, I mean, it sounds great. Also goes well with a great hangover the next day, no doubt. There's another one that's actually a little bit cheaper, but it's sold out. So obviously in demand, it must be even better than the Elegido. So we found the most expensive one, 250 59 euros for Vega Sicilia Unico, which is a wine from Ribera del Duero, a region a few hours north of here, very hot region, uh, to 2005, and it's one of Spain's most famous wines. So a lot of supermarkets wouldn't have a wine that good. Actually, supermarket wine selections are often pretty lacking in this country, but this is a really big supermarket, so it does. So often you'll find the most expensive one will be around maybe 15 euros max, and everything downhill to, to 165 or whatever that other one was. But my little tip, if you want to drink great wine when you're in Spain, I would stick away from anything under like six euros. The minute you hit like nine, 10, hit up to 12 euros, you're going to drink some really good wine. And you know, the cheap stuff, it's fine, but it still can taste pretty cheap. So I would say six, seven euros and upwards. But I don't know, what do you guys drink? Let me know. Let me know what you drink when you're in Spain. And maybe I'm completely wrong and I'm a wine snob and you're like, shut the hell up. So we'll see. A little anecdote here, if you're not drinking wine in a bar and you want a non-alcoholic drink, you drink Mosto. Mosto is effectively grape juice. But one thing I love about this brand, Grape, it's what Yoli's parents sometimes drink, is that it's spelled G-R-E-I-P because then if you don't speak English and you're Spanish and you pronounce it Grape, it sounds like you're saying grape. But with your Spanish accent, if it was spelled like we spell it, G-R-A-P-E, people would say Grape. So my mother-in-law says, Quiero un poquito de grape. I feel like grape. And it's been spelled perfectly for that. So kind of genius, really, right? Of course, you know how much we love gazpacho, that cold tomato soup. In this country, we have like a whole mini section here of different gazpachos that in the end, they're all pretty similar, I guess, but different brands. And we've got a gourmet one down here with almond in it. We've also got up here salmorejo, which is the slightly thicker style of tomato puree soup. You don't drink as much, but you do with a spoon. So serious gazpacho section here. So while we're in the cold soup section, salmorejo and gazpacho, also when you're in Spain and it's summer, see if you can get ajo blanco, which means white garlic, but it's actually made from ground up almonds. And it's this beautiful white almond cold soup with garlic in there, often served with grapes. And my God, in summer, it is so refreshing. In case you missed the cured meats in the other spot, we've got a whole aisle of cured meats here again, of sausage and chorizo and salchichon, just in case, of course. York, Y-O-R-K, like the city in England, that is the name we have for what we call English style ham, which is boiled ham. This is a, you know, this is not the best looking version of it. It comes better, but jamon york is exactly that, is, is boiled classic uh, ham, like they might have in New Zealand, for example. And what the hell is this? Chopped, it's literally just called chopped, or choped, if you're speaking Spanish. So that is a word that's come into the Spanish language, obviously from English, and we call it here choped, and it just means really cheap cuts of processed ham. So keep away from the choped, stick to the jamon iberico de bayota, please. More time. Us. In this case, mushrooms and garlic. And yeah, okay, a little closer than the dry bread or crackers. You know, you can do better than this in the, than the frozen version, even though it says gourmet. So I'd make it at home with fresh mushroom and garlic. Patatas paravas, frozen patatas paravas. So, okay, closer to tapas than some of the other things we've seen, but you can get better patatas paravas in a bar than probably these frozen ones. Okay, so it's getting real here in the supermarket, almost political because we're in the sabores del mundo, flavors of the world, and we have churros, churros rellenos. Now, why would churros be in the international section in a Spanish supermarket? But that's because these are stuffed or filled churros, filled with chocolate. We don't stuff churros in this country with chocolate, a barbarity that's, that's been brought in. We just have them plain and dip them in chocolate. And the other thing, fideuá. Now, this is a Catalan dish. It's kind of like paella, but it uses little noodles instead of rice. And so they've got a Catalan dish in the flavors of the world section. So I don't know if it's a political statement or just sheer recklessness, but that could cause a, an incident. Frozen paella, yes, we also eat frozen, well, we don't eat frozen paella in Spain, but they have frozen paella in Spain. Avoid, this one says you can cook it in five minutes. No good paella was ever made in five minutes. How long should it take, like an hour? 
Yeah. 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 45 minutes an hour. Now this is a country that knows how to do the aperitif. And look at the section of the supermarket behind me of all these olives and pickled skewers of things. And even they actually fry, cut and fry their own potato chips here because it's such a huge tradition of potato chips in this country and homemade potato chips, and pickled eggplant, olives, just so much going on. And so I fell in love with the aperitif tradition in this country. You can see why. Look at this, amazing, the best way to start. I was gonna say start the day, but no. Before lunch, before lunch, don't start the day with the aperitif. That would mean you're an alcoholic. Guys, we made it out alive, stealth mission complete. I've got my little carrito here. Thumbs up if you enjoyed that little exploration of a Spanish supermarket. Subscribe if you want to explore more of Spain with me. And well, thanks for watching. We'll see you in the next video. Ciao.